Watching your child balloon up with hives or struggle to breathe due to a food allergy is a terrifying moment. It also means a long-term struggle to keep the food that they eat free from often very common things, such as peanuts, eggs, or fish. Writer Sloane Barnett faced that in her family, and the search for answers led her to Dr. Kari Nadeau, a leading expert in adult and pediatric allergy and asthma. And that led to a fascinating collaboration, a book which they co-authored called The End of Food Allergy, the first program to prevent and reverse a 21st century epidemic. And Sloane Barnett joins us now from Miami, Florida, with more. It's so good to meet you, and uh, hope you're doing okay. How's life down there? Everything's great. Thank you so much for having me. Delighted to have you here. We're going to start with an excerpt from the book and then dive in. Here we go. Food allergy, you write, is entering a new era. For decades, we have grappled with this alarming and perplexing epidemic that has affected an increasing number of children and adults. Yet science has had little to offer to those fated to a life of fear about possible death, albeit very rare, by accidental exposures. That time is over. Gone are the days when avoiding a food at all costs was the only option, when nothing could be done and no one had any clues about treatment. Okay, Sloan, let's get into this and figure out how you, uh, you know, essentially have the potential here to change the lives of millions and millions of people. It starts with a chance encounter with Dr. Nadeau which eventually leads to this book. How did the chance encounter happen? Well, great question. Um, my children at the time, age two and six months, were diagnosed, as you heard, early in days, uh, both with peanut and the other with tree nut allergies. And as a mom, that's really frightening. You live your life every day wondering where the next drama will come, where the next danger will come. Um, you go to restaurants, birthday parties, and you just don't know um, when your kid's going to get into serious trouble. And uh, we happened to be at a wedding. We met this delightful couple across the way called the Wisers, and um, they turned out to be amazing advocates for food allergy in the U.S. Um, we started to talk, and as you know, if you're a, a parent who's dealt with food allergy, inevitably the conversation comes up, and it did. Um, and they said, wow, you know, you're from the Bay Area. You haven't met Dr. Kari Nadeau at Stanford, and we hadn't. These were early days in food allergy. Um, the, the oral immunotherapy was just beginning. And so we ran down there to meet this fabulous six foot tall doctor with five children with the most amazing bedside manner of anyone I've ever met. Um, we enrolled our two children. We were very lucky to enroll both kids in, in clinical trials, one through Harvard and one through Stanford. Um, and the journey began, which inevitably led to this book. Now, you know, any parent can take all the precautions in the world that they think they can take, and still there are moments when stuff seeps in. What, I mean, presumably you had some of those moments. What were the after effects of them? Well, it, uh, as I said, it's truly frightening because you never know where danger is. So you think that avoidance is something that can work, right? That's easy. You just don't eat the nuts and you'll be fine. We cleaned our house out of all nuts. Um, you know, not so bad when it's nuts, but imagine if your child's allergic to dairy and you can't have milk in your coffee. I mean, there are sacrifices to be made. And eventually I had a third child who wasn't allergic at all. He's never eaten a nut because he <laughs> never had them in the home. And he's so frightened of them because all he heard was how scary they are. So then you have to take your kid to a birthday party and grill the parents about what possibly is in the birthday cake. Or how about when you go to a restaurant? I mean, how many times have I talked to a waiter about what could possibly be in the food? And of course, the poor waiter's in charge of six tables, let's say, at one time. And they really only have control between when they take your order and they give it to the chef in the kitchen. What goes on in the mixer, the oven, the bowls, the flatware, hmm. they have no control over that. And how many times were mistakes made? I mean, I say, and I can now say it in a flippant way, thank you to Kari Nadeau, my daughter has thrown up all over the world, um, <laughs> literally. And, and we have gotten ourselves in trouble time and time again. How many EpiPen moments over the years? Um, very few, thank you. Um, my daughter seems to prefer to vomit than to um, <laughs> go into anaphylaxis, which is our great fortune, because as you probably read in the book, 
you know, and it happens hundreds of times in the U.S. Um, there are deaths. That's the worst that can happen. But anaphylaxis can also just be a super scary moment. Thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of emergency room visits, enormous expense, and um, and really scary moments for an inordinate amount of kids. Mm -hmm. Now, help us understand this, because when we were kids, I mean, none of this happened. You could eat peanuts anywhere to your heart's delight. And now all of a sudden, you know, peanut butter could be a, a, you know, a ticket to disaster for so many kids. So why have food allergies somehow been so on the rise over the past couple of decades? I mean, that's the big question here. So mm -hmm. the numbers tell it all. I mean, the, the rates of food allergy have just skyrocketed um, from below, say, 2% in the 50s. And back then, I don't even think anybody spoke about food allergy. No waiter would certainly ever ask you. And there, were no, there was no special table at the cafeteria where the food allergy kids had to sit, banished from the rest of the community. Today, we're looking at 8% of kids, 10% of adults. I mean, it's just an enormous, crazy rise in what is now a commonplace term, food allergy. So why? Why is the big question. There are many reasons. There is a lot of science. There's no one specific answer, but there are a lot of hypotheses, starting with the hygiene hypothesis. Mm. Um, that just says we are too clean. Everything about us is too clean. We have antibacterial soap and chemical detergent and bleach everywhere in our homes and become this cloud of cleanliness. Um, the problem with that is we never give our immunity a chance to build up defense. And so there's this theory that says that we've done this to ourselves in essence, that our immune systems are compromised, that we never give ourselves a chance. So that's one theory. Next up is the skin, our great barrier. Um, that's referred to as the atopic march. As you know, you know, a lot of little infants can have eczema, little patches of red skin that can become cracked. And what's said by scientists is that the protein somewhat in the air or being eaten by a parent actually seep through the skin. And because the skin is supposed to be a barrier, it immediately attacks, like it attacks when you get bitten by a bug. And our immune system thinks that there's danger in our system. So it attacks and it triggers these allergic reactions like the ones you mentioned at the top of the show. So blown up lips or hives on your skin or much worse when you're vomiting or when your throat starts to swell, anaphylaxis can ensue. So the atopic march is a definite theory around it. Then there's vitamin D. People think, scientists believe, that we are not getting enough vitamin D. We spend all our time indoors, like right now. Um, if we're not indoors, we're slathering ourselves in SPF, which on the one hand we know is necessary because we certainly don't want to get in any skin cancer. But on the other hand, we're not getting any vitamin D. So there's a link between that and food allergy. And, and I would talk about one last one, which is avoiding it all together and not exposing our kids early enough. So when you and I were kids, and in fact, when we first had our children, even you know 20 years ago, I was told not to eat peanut during my pregnancy, not to eat various things, right? Remember that? Yep. And then when the kids were born, certainly don't feed them those items. And you know, breast milk is so much better than any dairy-based formula for, for that reason and many others, obviously. Um, now we know the opposite is true. And this is a very, very important note, which is that parents should be feeding these substances, these so-called allergens, early days. As soon as four months old, when they first start eating solid foods, we need to be exposing children to these things, um, showing them that showing the body and the immune system that shellfish is okay, dairy is great, peanuts are all right. Um, and back in the day, we weren't doing that. And here we are with skyrocketing levels of food allergy, but there is hope. Thank God there are solutions more now than ever before. And uh, that's why the book is here. And that's what we hope to show people. Well, let's hit on one of those solutions right now. We're two decades into your personal circumstances of when you dealt with this with your little kids. Uh, the, the kids obviously in their 20s now. Uh, so two decades later, immunotherapy. Tell us what that is and how it works. Um, 
Yeah. So that's really what the book is about. IOT, we call it. Um, and that's what my children, and I would really even call it endured. It's not easy. So here we are with an immune system that's overreacting to normal old foods, deciding that a peanut is the enemy. And what the immune system does is it develops these antibodies called IgE. And the, once you have, let's say, a peanut IgE, the minute a child or an adult consumes any form of peanut, the body attacks as though there's an invader in your system and thus ensues all of those reactions that we talked about. What immunotherapy, auto, you know, oral immunotherapy is here to do is convince the body otherwise. Tell it that these foods, the dairy, the milk, the egg, are really just foods like they're supposed to be. And so how do we do that? It's tiny little amounts of the protein in a very, very controlled environment. And I'm going to say that again and again, controlled environment. This isn't something that you can be doing at home. These things are done at a hospital, in an academic environment, at a doctor's office, in a private clinic, around nurses who are watching the patients. Um, these proteins are given in a very organized manner. They're very, very pure. So, you know, what Dr. Nadeau likes to say is that when she uses a nut in her, in her clinic, um, those nuts are hopefully grown without the presence of anything else around so that we can absolutely assure perfect cleanliness of that protein. Then they're measured on a laboratory scale. They're maintained. I've seen these incredible pantries refrigerated. It's all done in a very, very controlled environment. And then once the diagnosis has happened, which is done um, in various ways, my children were done through food challenges. It was a long time ago. Now we have much better diagnostics through um, skin tests, blood tests, um, basophil tests. So things are really rapidly getting better in terms of that. But after food challenge, and we know that the child or the adult, the patient is allergic to a certain substance, they are fed tiny, tiny amounts of these proteins over long periods of time, attempting to convince the immune system um, that they no longer need to produce those antibodies, that these foods are not the enemy, that they will be okay. And it's a hard and a very long road that my children and many, many other patients, and many hopefully more, have to go through because there are side effects. And the side effects are that the body thinks it's being attacked. But in fact, those side effects are a good thing because the body is progressing to a point where it can eat those foods safely. How does a parent know if their child is a good candidate for immunotherapy? Well, um, that's, the, that, that's a, also a great question. For starters, you need to find the right doctor. And that's not always easy. Um, I did some research on Canada. Um, I also spoke to Dr. Nadeau, who tells me that OIT is happening um, very successfully in your country, um, in Montreal, in Quebec, in British Columbia, in academic institutions, and I bet in private clinics as well. Um, so you have to reach out. Um, it's a sacrifice. It's costly. Um, your health system happens to cover it. Um, I'm not allowed to say in a better way maybe than ours. Um, You're allowed to say that. Truth. In fact, I think you just I'm did. I'm allowed to say. <laughs> okay. Oops, sorry. Um, and, uh, and, and so you have to find the right practitioner who can help you through a long road. Um, you know, you might ask, well, how long is the road? You know, some say six months to get to a place where you're no longer at risk for anaphylaxis, you know, upwards of two years, hopefully, to get to a place where you can actually, you know, eat a Snickers bar or drink a full glass of milk or a yogurt. Um, not everybody gets there. And, um, uh, the kids can get really scared. Um, you know, my daughter, I told her this morning I was going to tell you this story because people tend to really enjoy hearing about this because um, it had a good ending. But we went down to Stanford time and time again, week after week. She missed lots of school. Um, we would sit there for hours on end. And if she wasn't doing her homework, she was watching The Hunger Games. They had a TV and they would allow you to watch various movies. And no matter what I put on, she wanted to watch The Hunger Games. So when I tell you how many times I've seen The Hunger Games, I could <laughs> probably right now on your show recite the entire movie. Um, and we would watch The Hunger Games. And then there was also a drug associated alongside the protein. Um, Zolaire is a drug that's often used for asthma, but they've shown that it allows the body 
to um, get used to the protein in a quicker manner. So they would give the child, my daughter in this case, a shot of the Zolaire. The problem with the Zolaire, it's a very thick liquid, very painful. And my daughter was not a great patient. And so a lot of crying and a lot of screaming. Um, and then, of course, you're upping the dose of the protein. And, and we know that we're waiting for a reaction because that's how they know that it's working. So my daughter would sit there, imagine, watching the Hunger Games, had to get this terribly painful shot, and eventually knew she was either going to get hives or throw up or get sick or worse, go into anaphylaxis. Hmm. They were dramatic and traumatic days, I will tell you. But in the end, my daughter's in college. She's very successful there. Um, she can go on dates to restaurants. And while she always asks what's in the food, um, she knows that she'll likely be okay. Um, and she can, you know, I'll embarrass her here. She can kiss a boy and not worry <laughs> if he's just had a candy bar, um, you know, and she can live her life. And for us and for those who are families with food allergy, for the amazing doctors like Dr. Nadeau and the scientists who have spent decades trying to get to this place, it's a miracle um, that we can prevent the deaths and prevent um, the real dramatic life of living with food allergy. Well, let's finish up on this because you call it a miracle, but would you say it's a, because I, I don't know if you, I don't know if this is the word you use. Is it a miracle cure? Is your daughter cured? Um, that's also a fabulous question. Cure is a big word. Um, cure probably means in my mind forever. Um, the science isn't old enough to know if we're in this forever. Um, what I can tell you is that my kids are doing great. Um, a lot of the kids that we talk about in the book are having very successful, um, filled with food life. Um, and so, and, and IOT is becoming more nationally recognized. It's more and more available. There are private clinics opening up everywhere, which is a great success for, for these families who suffer. Um, so a cure, we sure do hope so. Um, what we know is that the science has proven that we can deal with food allergy, that we can help these families, that they will be able to eat these foods safely, that they will not be at risk for anaphylaxis. Is this forever? That's a promise we're not yet ready to make, but we hope to make any time now. Amen to that. Uh, we are delighted to remind people your contribution to this story is the end of food allergy, the first program to prevent and reverse a 21st century epidemic, and we're delighted that it's brought Sloan Barnett to our program from Miami, Florida. Sloan, great to meet you. Thanks so much for this. Thank you, really, for having me. An important topic. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.